hello, and welcome to the Payments.com digital discussion on real-time fraud detection. I'm Karen Webster. So what if someone told you that you could save your organization nearly half a billion dollars in cold, hard cash and the reputational cost associated with the downside of a data breach? and that all you had to do was just recognize in real time the abnormal activity that is a cyber crook at work, and then act on that knowledge using a variety of tools and techniques that actually could shut down that fraudster much sooner. Well, now that may be actually as easy to do as it sounds. And there are a variety of ways that artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies can be deployed to detect the abnormal activity that is a data breach in the making. Today, we're going to get a perspective on the latest and greatest ways to do that by two executives from Brighterian, a technology company that's in the business of fighting, fighting fraud on behalf of banks, retailers, acquirers, and a host of leading global companies, Neil Jones and Dr. Thomas Rand Nash. Neil Thomas, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. So you guys are going to tell us what we don't know, we don't know, and how getting in the know could help everyone listening become employee of the year or maybe even the decade. I would say saving $500 million might qualify for that recognition, wouldn't you guys? Yeah, a little bit. This is, this is, this is, this is interactive, Neil Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 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 uh, and, and for all of you listening, this is interactive, so please feel free as you're listening to, uh, to post questions. I'll be inserting them throughout the process. But before Neil and Thomas uh, get started, I'd like to have Julie Conroy from IK go through a few minutes reprising the state of play in cybercrime and some of the costs that organizations actually realize from actually not taking the action they need to catch it in time. So Julie, can you start us off? Great, thanks so much, Karen. As we look at this graphic that is just a snapshot of the myriad data breaches that we've seen in the headlines over the last couple of years, this, this really emphasizes that right now the, the cyber criminals are winning. Um, and as I talk to many merchants in particular out there, you know, they're operating under the mindset that you know, these days it's not a matter of if they're going to get breached, it's, it's, it's a matter of when and how quickly can they detect it because, you know, unlike those of us that are operating for the forces of good, the bad guys don't need to make a business case to iterate forward their attacks on the financial services value chain. Not only are those of us that are steeped in the payments industry all too aware of these breaches, but consumers are also feeling the pain. <laughs> And even though consumers don't necessarily, you know, have a lot of, you know, physical skin in the game, they don't have, you know, the, the issuers and the merchants absorb the majority of the cost of the breach, it does impact their day-to-day -day lives. You know, they do have to, you know, in some cases, get a new set of credit cards and reestablish all those numbers. There's an inconvenience. There's a perception of insecurity that comes with having their data compromised in a breach. We did some research. Uh, last year in which we talked to consumers that did have either some portion of their identity or some portion of their card account numbers impacted in database breaches. Um, while in many cases the, the blame for those breaches in part went to the merchants where, where the breaches took place, in many cases the backlash also hit the financial institutions. And over half of the consumers that we interviewed who had experienced an account or an identity compromise change their banking relationship as a result. There's also just a um, degradation of transactional activity that happens in the wake of these breaches. So another piece of research that we did in which we surveyed consumers across 20 different countries last year, one of the questions we asked the consumers was, when you did experience fraud, did you choose to use cash or an alternative payment method over that credit or debit card that was impacted? 
Uh, what you see here is just a subset that is only for the United States, although as you look at the other 19 countries, the results look very similar. And this really quantifies the fear that is top of mind for many of the issuers I talk to. And that's the fear that in the wake of a, a card compromise event, the impacted card goes to the back of wallet. And again, it, it, in many cases, it wasn't necessarily anything the issuer could have done to control the event. Um, you know, the breach took place at a merchant or a processor. But in the consumer's mind, there is a perception of insecurity associated with that card. Or it's just the fact that the new card came in the mail and it sat on top of that stack of mail for a month before the consumer remembered to activate it and get it back into the wallet. So this really emphasizes the importance of detecting these data breach events quickly and being able to take compensating controls so that the consumer, the issuer, and the merchant all have a mitigated impact. Um, so to talk about some of those, those controls, I'm going to turn it over to the Brighterian folks. Hi. So, um, so before, the, before we do that, um, uh, thanks, Julie. So, so Neil, uh, we are going to get into the really interactive portion of, of the session. For those of you who are listening, we're going to play a little data breach game show. Um, we're going to rip on Jeopardy, and this is, well, this is the fun it, part. It could so, only be uh, so, so, Neil, you're it, – it, it, yeah, Jeopardy, it's kind of an interesting choice of – game show uh, theme, it, it kind of works. Um, so the way this is going to go is I'm going to give the answer, and Neil, hopefully you know the right question. So are you ready to get started? I'm ready to get started. Over to you, Karen. Announce number okay. one. Okay. So, Neil, 557. Yes. The All question right. is? That's quite a hard one, but I think the answer is going to be it's the number of data breaches that have been reported to the California Attorney General since 2012 in January. And wow. to put some context around that, uh, the California AG brought in legislation very similar to the cybersecurity bill on the reporting of data breaches that's starting to progress through uh, the Senate and the House. And uh, it requires reporting of any data breach that affects over 500 Californians. Uh, to the AG in a very short space of time, as soon as they know about it, in fact. So there's actually been 557 in the last three years and a bit, which is pretty huge. Wow. Uh, uh, that, that number seems shocking to me. Um, is that number shocking to you? It should be shocking, but I, I think there's some, some other statistics that are, that are even more shocking as you go. All right, so maybe uh, let's, do, uh, let's do our second question. Uh, so the answer is 27. That's a, at least a better number than 557. So the, the, the question is? And I think the question is, in the last month, how many data breaches have been reported to the California AG? So that's 27 in the last month in April. So it's actually wow. more, more than the average. It's on the increase. It's not been as quiet as everyone thinks. Well, well that, that's an interesting point because we haven't actually heard about 27 instances of data breaches in the last month. So how do you reconcile the 27 that have been reported to what we've actually heard about in the, in, in, in the media? What's, the, what's the, dis the discrepancy? I think there's a bit of desensitization that's gone on over the last year since Target and Home Depot and you know, Neiman Marcus, Jimmy John's, all of those big breaches. People are a bit desensitized about the whole thing, and it's, it's wrong. They shouldn't be. When you actually look at the list on the California AG's website, there's some pretty big names sitting in that 27 for April. Wow. Uh, care, care to reveal any of those big names? Uh, I think folks should look for themselves. I think it'll be far more shocking okay. to see, see that than to see, you know, what I think about it. Uh, there's a, a very, okay. very big financial services company who's revealed that one of their processes or more than one of their processes have had breaches. Interesting. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try answer number three, 90%. Uh, that, that, that's already scaring me. So, um, so what's the question? Well, 
we know about the big ones, but I think this is about small businesses, and I think 90% of small businesses, uh, so they've actually got data breaches. So it's the percentage of small the data breaches that affect small merchants, not the big boys. That, now that's interesting because I, I think the the perception, at least on the part of small merchants, is that because they're small, they're actually not a target. Why why are they such a target? But they're actually the soft target because small merchants typically don't have the the sort of intrusion prevention systems, etc., that the big merchants have. So. Uh, they're recognized as being a soft target, and the quote by Jason Oxman uh, from the ETA revealed that back in the LA Times in July of last year, on Independence Day last year, in fact. So they're, wow. they're, a, big, they're a, a big target. And if you look at the Jimmy John's breach, there were 104 other uh, restaurants that were all singletons, or the largest was a chain of three, uh, that were affected by that breach as well, which was, of course, a POS malware breach uh, coming from the POS supplier. Interesting. Um, if okay, you're, so you're, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, I'm sorry. Also, if you're, I was just going to say, if you're a small business, a data breach could easily put you out of business. No, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point, and we're going to get into uh, some of the cost of all of this in, in just a minute, but let's move on to answer four. 71%. Should I feel comforted by that? What's the what's the que because that's that's at least better than than 90. What's the question? Well, uh, the question for this is, what's the number of businesses that didn't know about the data breach when they found out about it? They were informed by an outsider. Yep. Wow. When you say, when you say an outsider, tell me tell me what you mean by that. Uh, the networks, the acquirer the uh, law enforcement potentially. There's one very large data breach where they found out about it from law enforcement uh, before anyone else. So, you know, I, wow. I think it's better to find out about it yourself than have the local sheriff or the FBI knocking on your door, quite frankly. Yeah, no, uh, that, 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 that's for sure. And I know we're going to talk a little bit, in, in just a little bit, about um, some of the implications of that. But let's move on to our final Answer question pair, seven dollars and ninety nine cents. Oh that's cheap. Question isn't it? is seems cheap. I'd buy it's it. Very, it's not very scary, is it? It's nicely positioned at ninety nine cents. But I think it's actually quite yeah. scary because I think this is the this was discovered by an ABA study and it's the average cost per car that is compromised to the issuer. So if you take the fraud, wow. if you take the reissuance cost of the car and the increased customer service cost for every single car that an issuer has that's subject to a data breach, that's the cost that they have to take as a hit straight off. Wow. That's, yep. uh, so that, 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 little, that little number is, uh, is very scary when you multiply that, multiply that times the number of cards well, in an issuer's portfolio. Yep. And if you had... Only 10,000 cards, and we're a very small issuer. $80,000 is a big hit. If you've got a million cards, it's a very big hit. Right. So, um, so this this has been an interesting perspective to look at these five data points and five very compelling, shocking statistics about the cost of data breach. I know, Neil, you're going to walk us through a case study of the Home Depot breach, something obviously everyone is, is, is very aware of. But, but why don't you talk us through um, the Home Depot situation? And a lot of people may not know some of the specific details, so, uh, so take it away. Sure, thank you. Well, the first, uh, the Home Depot breach commenced approximately on the 1st of April, according to all the information that we have, and was announced on the 2nd of September. So if you look at the amount of time until everyone knew about it, that there was a data breach at Home Depot, that was 155 days. And it only took 10 days to actually close the breach once Home Depot knew about it. So that was fairly wow. speedy but that's a pretty big gap from April the 1st through to the 2nd of September. So a 
total of 155 days. So it's a lot of damage that can be done with a data breach that's 155 days long. And there's all sorts of different views as to the total length on average of different breaches, but it's anywhere from an average of 100 days for some breaches up to 220 days. So pretty significant all around. Wow. And, 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 so, and, and so what, what 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 happened on September the second? So so it was obviously discovered, but but what was the what was the event that made it discoverable? Publication of the Wall Street Journal. Um, <laughs> there was there was a lot of a lot of issuers had news for a couple of weeks before that there was a breach in place. Um, there was a lot a lot of discussion going around at the time that there was a potential breach there. But September the 2nd uh, was the day that the Wall Street Journal said, hey, there's a data breach at, at Home Depot. A lot of the issuers that I deal with that are regional banks and below had no clue until that article came up in the Wall Street Journal or they were starting to hear some information from the networks for a couple of days before. But yeah, they, wow. they were clueless. And in a couple of cases, they weren't even able to reissue plastic for a couple of months because there was no reissuance window available to actually produce and reissue the plastic. Wow. That's a, and that is definitely an outsider you don't want notifying you of a problem, the Wall Street Journal. You don't want to be in that headline. Um, no. So, 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 so talk us through, you've given us, again, the, uh, the really compelling case analysis here of what happened and the impact financially on the part of the issuer and the merchant. Um, but perhaps talk us through the stages of the data breach and, and, and kind of get us acclimated to where the detection that could have compressed that 155 days could actually take, take place. Okay, I think that's, that's, that's a good plan because there's five different stages of a merchant data breach. That's the first stage which is perimeter security. So you have an opportunity to stop the criminals when they get into your network. So if you can stop them at that stage, it's really good. The second stage is intrusion detection. So they've got over the perimeter and now they're trying to get into your system. Do you have a solution in place that can actually spot that intrusion into your IT systems or your POS systems of your business? Stage three is endpoint security. So they've got over the top, they've got into the system. Can you actually stop them and spot them as they're doing bad stuff, such as loading malware onto your centralized systems to be dispatched out to all of your POSs in house? Or even if it's just a sole POS, do you have a way of spotting the, the bad actor who works for you? has taken the USB stick in and loaded some malware in to start you know, getting numbers and details. Stage four is exfiltration detection. And this means they've got in, they've got the numbers. Can you stop them extracting those card numbers, that personal information from your system? Do you have a solution that does that? And if all of those solutions fail, then we have the last stage, which is fraud prevention. So they've, they've exfiltrated numbers. They're now selling them on the dark web to folks that can turn them into plastic cards themselves to use fraud. Or alternatively, they're using them for, um, they're using them for, um, for other details such as you know, CNC transactions themselves, but the vast majority of cases with the massive data breaches, they've been actually selling the cards and someone else has been committing the, the more dangerous fraud of going in and using the stolen card in a counter-seated form. And this is where iDetect actually fits in. So iDetect fits in here and it's a fraud prevention system. So when the fraud starts to take place, iDetect is what actually spots that straight away. And with a bit of luck, the criminal is now looking very unhappy behind bars and has been stopped from committing pretty severe fraud. Wow. So, so, so does that, 
um, does that compress that, you know, what you showed us in the Home Depot example, the 155 days, how does that impact the 155 days? Well, I'm, I'm not going to spoil the show like that, but it significantly reduces it, hugely reduces it, in fact. So even if your all of your systems have failed, iDetect can come in whether you're a merchant, whether you're an issuer, uh, whether you're an acquirer, that can actually help you to reduce that number and hugely compress that average breach time, or in the Home Depot case, the 155 days can be that could have been potentially reduced hugely. So let's, let's not fall the, the surprise. Let's see some more on that in a few minutes. Okay. All right. So, uh, so Thomas, I think uh, I think we're going to turn it over to you now, and uh, I think you're going to walk us through the mechanics of how we can turn those cute little burglars into those sad-looking burglars behind bars. Because uh, uh, as we as we discussed in our in our prep, it's amazing how the the, the icons for the cyber criminals all look so funny and fun. They're really not. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thank you very much, Karen. I'm just going to briefly walk us through uh, some of the technology behind iDetect. Um, so iDetect uh, consists of, of two components. Um, on one hand, we have a real-time uh, risk scoring engine, uh, and then we couple that with a real-time uh, merchant profiling engine. Uh, if we look a little deeper here at the, at the risk uh, scoring engine, um, if we, if we think about the data that's incoming to the system, so it could be issuer, it could be processor data, it could be acquirer data, um, we take that in and we run it through uh, a number of different uh, technological features of the system, uh, and this is really where uh, the Bryterian approach shines and, and differentiates us, we think. Um, we do uh, what's called one-to-one -one behavioral profiling on every single entity in the system. And so when I, when I say entity, of course, uh, you're thinking cards or merchants, and, and that's true. We, we do do that, but uh, we really want to get a, a bit more insight in, into uh, all the data that we have in the system, uh, all of the actors in the system as well. And so we'll, we'll profile merchants, we'll profile cards, but we'll also dig a little deeper thinking about uh, geographic regions perhaps or uh, periods of time, uh, geographic regions over periods of time. We really want to dig down into the data uh, and try to develop behavioral profiles of everything that could be of interest. Uh, once those profiles are developed, we then couple that uh, with our artificial intelligence technology, so neural networks, uh, data mining, case-based reasoning. Uh, we, we employ uh, 10 different artificial uh, intelligence technologies together for a comprehensive approach, and then we couple that with the one-to-one -one behavioral profiling, and, and those together uh, really comprise the bulk of the real-time scoring engine. Now, if we think about this in, in practice and how this works, uh, you'll have your transactions running through the system. You'll have your cards, in this case, uh, going through the system. And then the real-time scoring engine uh, applies the, uh, the artificial intelligence technologies from any labeled data or instances of fraud or detection uh, or breach detection that we have in the past. Uh, and then as those transactions are running through the system, those profiles then are populated uh, with information. So, uh, you know, as transactions are coming in, as, as merchants are accepting uh, transactions, uh, we're populating those profiles. Of course, we're, we're tracking the geographic locations of all the different locations and branches for all of those different merchants. And then that enables us to identify, in this case, uh, cards or transactions that are either suspicious, so here in yellow, uh, that, that seem to be good to us, so obviously green there, uh, taking a stoplight approach, or ones that are, are suspicious to us and, and flagged, so red uh, in this case. From there, we move to the, to the real-time merchant uh, profiling engine. So again, all this happens in real time, and, and the goal of the merchant profiling engine is to take all those transactions that we've scored from the scoring engine and then identify which particular branches uh, which merchant locations uh, those individual transactions correspond to, and from then we're able to identify uh, which branches uh, we think that the that the breach uh, took place in. So uh, from there, um, there's a little bit about the technology, but uh, I think Neil's itching to uh, to get to the results here. Uh, per your earlier question, Karen, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to him. So, so be, before before we do that, though, Thomas, a, a, a quick question um, for you. So I'm I'm going back to the slide. We don't have to go back to it, but but it, it talks about the stages of a of a merchant data breach, and it's interesting that um, you know the assumption here is that 
the cyber criminals are going to be smart enough to find their way into systems no matter what we do to try to keep them out. Is that, is that really what, what you're saying? Uh, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's our position that it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Um, I mean, you know, the criminals are incredibly smart, and they really have nothing to do but sit around and think about ways to, to get access to your data. Um, and so our approach is that it's, it's really not a question of if, of if, it's a question of when. And, and given that it's a question of when, then the, the impetus is to try to shorten the exposure uh, as much as humanly possible. Uh, and that's what our solution focuses on. And, and specifically, you know, I, I know that, that your, um, your scoring engines and your profiling engines get smarter as, as you acquire more transaction activity. Can you speak to that a little bit, to get, give us a little bit more detail about, about some of how that works? Sure. Um, it's, it's adaptive learning uh, is what we call it here, um, and that takes place in, in two different dimensions for us. Uh, one is uh, because we are uh, profiling all the entities in the system over time and tracking their behavior, uh, we're able to identify that behavior as soon as it starts to deviate from, from the traditional norms or from the baselines that we have. Uh, and so we do long-term profiling all those entities, but we're constantly in real time updating all of those profiles. And so we can identify as that behavior shifts. And that's really important because the fraudsters are obviously shifting their tactics all the time. Uh, if you just use technologies that focus are backwards looking, so let's say you're looking uh, rules, uh, business rules, that kind of thing, uh, you're not going to be able to identify that behavior as it changes in real time, which is, is really where we focus. Uh, the second adaptive learning approach, you know, with nobody's perfect, uh, no models are perfect, but the, the key is really to learn from those mistakes when you make them so you don't make them again in the future. Uh, and for us, once any, let's say, false positives are identified, uh, they get fed back into the incremental learning algorithms for us and the models get updated in real time. Uh, and so that enables us to have uh, long, the models in, in situ for a very long time. Uh, they're constantly learning. And you're right, as more data gets put into the system, the better the models get. Okay, so, um, so, so, so Neil, now you're going to uh, sort of give us the punchline with, uh, with what would happen if we had sure. the benefit of, of this kind of technology. So, uh, so take it away. Sure, thanks very much, Karen. So what we, what we actually have here is this is the show me the money moment. This is, this is so what does it do? It's very clever technology. What are the results going to be? If we look at our, our simulation study that we, we've undertaken of Pfizer Tech, if we look at an average breach time frame of around about 150 days, yeah, as I said earlier, between 100 and 228 days are the, the assessments of the breach length on average. What you see with iDetect is, is quite phenomenal because of the way that we're looking at transactions and looking at the riskiness of those transactions and then taking them back to a common point of purchase, what we're actually seeing is an average result of five days on average. And on a median and mean basis, we're looking somewhere between four and 10 days for pretty much all the breach simulations that we've undertaken. So that means for the average breach, we're seeing sufficient to trigger a first data breach alert on at least one location in a multiple chain within five days, which is pretty spectacular. And so, 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 just, so, so going back, so, so wait, wait for a second, Neil. So going back to the Home Depot example, um, the the commencement was April the first, and it and it was announced on the second, and it was closed on September the twelfth. That was the 155 days open. You're saying that that with your simulations, that 155 days could be compressed that dramatically? Yep, potentially so. That's amazing. Uh, if you think how, about it, how, how do you, how? what we're actually seeing in many cases when we're looking at these, these back-based simulations is the fraudsters using the cards for even small test transactions, potentially. So these test transactions, that they're undertaking uh, using cards that they've harvested. Uh, if you think about it, they're the, they're the criminal IT company 
what they're doing is they're making sure that their algorithms that they're using for extracting the data are correct. So they want to make sure that the card details that they're harvesting, they can then repurpose back in the right order and use appropriately to undertake nefarious activity or make it the case in the vast majority of these cases nowadays, they're selling those card numbers on the dark web and someone else has the the face-to-face -face danger of undertaking the theft using counterfeited cards. So you're actually seeing I, I those, tra those transactions taking place. Have they got their algorithm right to repurpose the data? And iDetect is smart enough to pick up on those transactions even before they go fraudulent. So we're seeing that I increased see. riskiness, so. that change yeah. of behavior. And we're taking it back to that one common point of purchase and saying, this isn't right. And if we look at the, the chart that we've got up here, this shows the progression of an iDetect store for a merchant where we ran the server simulation. And you can see from day one through to day five and then down to day 10, what's actually occurring. And you're looking at a, an increased velocity of transactions taking place of a highly, of a, a more heightened riskiness. And that's actually triggering at day five here, that, that breach alert. So that first data breach alert is being thrown out at day five, saying we're seeing such anomalous behavior on this common point of purchase relating to these transactions that are occurring somewhere else that we think you should investigate that there's a, there could be a breach here. And you can also then see the drop-off that's occurring here. Uh, the interesting bit with this is they've done their test. They're now not running any more transactions through this merchant. And in the case of this one individual merchant location, you then see around about day 25 and day 26 uh, and beyond, this curve starting to increase going upwards and upwards and upwards and a never-ending increase. And that's when the wholesale harvesting and resale of card numbers is actually occurring. Wow, so, so, so what, you're, what you're saying is that this extended period of time that a breach goes undetected, the criminals are doing, you know, their little data tests and those are the things that aren't being detected that this system does detect, provides a warning, you know, hey, check into this, and, and therefore um, the breach can be detected and shut down in a much quicker period of time. Correct. And the, the beauty of this is it's giving the alert out so the protocols can then be followed by the merchant or potentially also by their acquirer to say, hey, you really should look into this. And yeah, it's obviously far more preferable to do have a breach that runs for, for five. You spot it after five days, you, you analyze it, and you close the breach after 15. And in many cases, you're able to, to shut the door on the criminal before they've done the huge damage. You know, five days compared to 150 days, which would you choose? Wow. So so here's a question uh, from from someone. This is This is... The thought that crossed my mind too, and, and uh, I, I'm sure Neil, this will be music to your ears. But but maybe you, you and Thomas can comment on this. So so if this is such a dramatic, if this creates such a dramatic change and reduces the cost so dramatically of of a breach, why isn't this a required piece of technology or a process on the on the part of the merchant? and the payments ecosystem. What are your thoughts? Have you, ta have you talked to the, to the acquirers and the merchants about this? Yeah, we're having discussions with, with acquirers and merchants about bringing the solution on board and making some pretty rapid progress with, with some of, uh, of each type. Uh, and also, very importantly, for issuing banks as well, because the other side comes with the card issuers. Because if you think about it for issuers, if an issuer can spot that there's a data breach of Merchant X very, very early, they can do two things. Uh, firstly, they can perhaps contact the merchant and say, hey, I think you've got an issue, and that helps everybody. The second aspect is uh, until that breach is closed, they can be applying 
and using solutions such as the ones that we have elsewhere in the toolkit criteria, uh, increased sensitivity can be applied to those cards that they know is breached, that they know are breached. So during that period, they know that if there's more anonymous transactions that start to occur, uh, there's a high likelihood that they could be from harvested cards because they should they'll be able to know from providing us with with data within within the solution. Um, yeah, I think what we have here is something that is highly, highly significant. Thomas? So, so I mean, so this would, this would be the the issuer that would have the requirement to do this, but but why isn't there more of an emphasis on this as a requirement? No, Karen. Interestingly, we have a uh, Karen. We have a we have a special guest star with us actually from from one of our our partners, uh, Ian Belchin. Here's the head of uh, risk at WorldPay UK uh, for acquiring. Uh, has a has a couple of thoughts on that. I guess this is this is something wow, that cameo uh, appearance. <laughs> indeed, uh, this is something that we're looking into at the moment from from a world pay perspective, because uh, we 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 partner with Criterion for a number of things, and actually this is something that we could use to protect our merchants and also to protect ourselves. So this is something that that's of great interest at the moment, and we're working with the guys to understand how we could implement this and how we could use this tool. To your point earlier, you know, what, why isn't it mandated? This, this is something that we could actually push out across our portfolio of merchants, and in the UK, that's some 370,000. So that, that's something we're keen to do and something we're looking at. Yeah, I mean, it would. Uh, I mean, I think it's a good point that was that was raised in terms of the the there are standards, obviously, that um, that the networks and uh, and and others. Impose to protect the integrity of of the system. It just seems to me that if this is if this is so effective, why we wouldn't be thinking along those same lines for something like this? Okay, so tell us what the little map with the circle is. That's the breach the location. Circle and the little red little the, red store the, storefront. I wonder where that is. So. Yeah, I would. All I would say is, yeah, you know, that's the, that's one of the breach locations. So that's this is geographic view. You can see all of the rest of the chain are green at the moment. There's no sign of a breach at any of those, but that's the first location to go red. And if we look at that to, that chart at the top, the 150 days on average, gradually more and more and more go yellow, then they go red. And if there's a second breach alert, we'll send out a black alert on them as well. So this, if there's two data breach alerts and an increased velocity occurring at, at the store after it goes red, you know, that's what you'll see. So that little red one is where the first test transactions are taking place in this case study. And that what we're seeing now is that's the, that's the first one to go. And if the merchant were to look at that and go, I need to investigate this, scan this POSs, they discover that there's malware sitting on them. Then they scan the rest of the network. They discover that there's malware sitting on those as well. Then they can close the breach very, very quickly. So it's in everyone's benefit to be using a solution like I detect. Hmm. Interesting. But let's move on. Just to look at some of those results again. Based on that sort of number, that's a 95% reduction in the total number of cards that would be compromised. It's also a 98% reduction in uh, estimated issuer losses. When you look at the volume of transactions going in that five divided by 150 days, it can absolutely destroy the criminal's value coming out of that merchant. It's phenomenal. And finally, if you're looking at insurers, if we look at uh, yeah, the losses that the insurer takes as well, uh, the data breach insurance provider for, for Home Depot, for example, according to Home Depot's own numbers, that at Q4 had taken a loss of around about $33 million um, in terms of its share of Home Depot's total loss, total internal losses of $63 million. So you know, the insurers could take some value out of this solution as well by 
helping to reduce the, the premium because at the moment there's a huge increase in premium for data breach insurance uh, mm -hmm. because they're suffering huge losses. So, yeah, reduced losses means reduced premium and it means reduced increased insurer profits as well. So they could win as well by this solution. Mm -hmm. So there we are. This 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 when we apply the simulation on average across the Home Depot breach in terms of those sort of numbers. What we, what we would see is 53.2 million cards saved, cards that would not have been compromised. We look at the total savings for, for issuers for the losses that they would incur at the first level. And that, that in this case would be 432, uh, four, sorry, 438 million issuer dollars saved. And then in terms of insurer losses, a reduction down to 29.4 million. Wow, that's uh, so that that's the that that's the compelling tada uh, slide that, 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 that sort of pulls all of this together. That, that's the, uh, that's that's the show me the money slide. Yeah, that's the show me the money slide for sure. Um, so so tell us a little bit about where you're getting traction with 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 this. I mean, you talked about the simulation model and and how you know in the lab, so to speak. This is 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 proving to reduce um, the time frame from 150 days down to five. But 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 where are you? Where are you getting interest? Where are you seeing traction? What are some of the? Uh, what are some of the? What's what's the market response to what it is you're saying? Uh, the, the good news is obviously Criterion is very well known in terms of providing high quality artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions, particularly in the fraud prevention area. So the market reaction that I'm seeing from my clients and my prospects is this is very compelling. We need to look at it and we need to look at it quickly. Because one of the things coming up is um, we know that with the MV coming in and the way MV is being implemented in, in the U.S., the general almost unsaid feeling in the marketplace is that there will be a spike in fraud as that goes forward. So come come October, the feeling is there's going to be a huge spike in fraud occurring as the forces and the criminals use the MB implementation as their opportunity uh, to extract more money out of the system and, and commit more fraud and commit more theft. So that's a that's a big concern. And yeah, uh, I think I, I might just ask if our, our guest can, can add some value as well to this. Yes, uh, thanks, Neil. I think uh, that I mean that's one of the key reasons I'm over here in the US at the moment is to see the uh, to see the Criterion guys to discuss this very you know this this very software. We truly see the value. We can understand how we can use it, how we can implement it, and how that works. And we already you know successfully partner with Criterion on a number of other products. So this just adds to the suite and it, it provides us with a real kind of uh, technology suite to be able to service our customers as best we can. So I, so I guess a question that, uh, that a lot of people have, um, especially if you're on the merchant side, um, how, how all of this fits together? There are so many different aspects of Fraud, obviously, as we went through the stages, and, and there are so many different approaches to managing it. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on how to pull all of this together. There obviously is a layering of, of, of solutions and a portfolio approach that needs to happen to keep uh, losses in check. Um, what is your advice in, in, uh, in, in helping the merchant community as well as the issuing community, think think through that uh, think through that challenge. Well, I mean, I, I think that's a very very good question, and this is this is an unusual solution in that you know seeing one of our attendees ask the question, does the solution sit in the issuers, the merchant acquirers, or at the merchant systems? Well, this is a solution that we Criterion can provide to issuers, 
in one form, to acquirers in another form, and directly to merchants as well. So the beauty of this solution for iDetect is that issuers can use it to reduce their losses, uh, and they can use it on an independent basis. The merchants that use the solution for alerts on their own merchant IDs, they can use it independently as well. And also, the acquirers can use it to monitor their portfolio of merchants to see if there are any increases in risk across the merchant IDs that they support. Um, because yeah, the danger, for example, is if we look at the Jimmy John's breach and the associated breach for signature systems with all of those small restaurants as well as Jimmy John's, what you actually saw was a POS system that had malware on it moving from the manufacturer through to the merchant. So, yeah, the merchant acquirer has got a great opportunity here to make sure that they're supporting their merchants. Potentially, they could earn more revenue from providing a great solution onto their merchants, but they can also make sure that you know, the hardware that they're supplying uh, or their lease provider is supplying to their customer, the end merchant, doesn't have any malware on it because they'll start to see those, uh, those increases coming through because they know what hardware is sitting for each mid. They're in a very privileged position to see that. So whether it's an issuer, whether it's a merchant acquirer, or whether it's a merchant directly, all parts of the chain could use iDetect independently in a slightly different way to make sure that they minimize their exposure to data breaches. So, so maybe maybe this is a naive question, but um, but if you know if I'm a merchant, I'm I'm listening to people talk about tokenization, end-to-end -end encryption. Um, now, now this as another aspect to fraud detection. Um, you know, perhaps there's fraud detection, there's fraud prevention. H how does it all work together? If a merchant is trying to prioritize investments in keeping their environment secure, what do you advise them? It depends in each of the areas because they want to be securing, going back to the slide, they want to be securing the perimeter, they want to be making sure that they're stopping people from getting in. But right at the end of the day, what we know from the fraud landscape to do with cars and other forms of fraud over history and over the last 30 years is the fraudsters and the criminals, their job is to go out and to breach systems, to steal card details, to counterfeit cards, to find new ways of extracting money from the system. That's how they're earning their income as, as criminal businesses or as individual criminal elements. So they're going in and that's their job. Our job is to make it as hard for them to do that as possible, but also to protect for when they do breach all of those safeguards because they are focusing all of their efforts on getting over the walls, getting into the system, extracting the data from the system. So that's, they're being very focused in their activity. So let's use the focus solution like I detect at the end that even if they've gone through, even if they've breached the systems, we're still going to close them down at the end of the day, early and quickly. And if they know that iDetect is in use at a merchant or an acquirer is, is signed up to using iDetect, what are they going to do? It's, it's almost like having the burglar, you know, the alarm company sign outside of your house. Um, what's one of the biggest single effects of having a, a burglar alarm in your house? It's that the criminal sees the sign and sees the system and decides they're going to burgle next door instead. And yeah, make it hard. And if they know that you're doing all you can to stop them getting in in the first place, and even if they do get into the system, they're going to be shut down fairly quickly. They're not going to expend their efforts in getting into your business. And they're not going to spend the efforts trying to, uh, in terms of an issuer, sell your cards on the dark web. Because if they know they're going to be shut down quickly, why would they waste their time? If they know that you, a certain acquirer uh, is using iDetect, why would they go after their merchant? And if they know that a merchant is using iDetect, uh, why would they go after them? So, you know, therefore, iDetect is a great preventative tool as well as a great detection tool to minimize the losses on both ends. But 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 isn't uh, isn't EMV designed 
to keep um, the cardholder credentials secure and through mobile uh, and you know, mobile payments and the tokenization schemes that the networks are putting into the market, um, aren't those supposed to mitigate the risk that this kind of compromise happens at the physical point of sale? That's one of the early mitigations. However, there have been EMV breaches. Uh, and what we actually have is uh, if you're looking at EMV breaches taking place, they have taken place over time. I was working with a, uh, a merchant a few months ago, and the merchant in question was subjected to fraud that was taken back to a data breach. The majority of the fraud that they suffered was on Canadian cards. It wasn't American cards. It was Canadian cards. So uh, someone had cloned cards in a data breach and use them to commit fraud on that merchant to a very significant level. 75% of the total fraud that they suffered, and they were threatened with a withdrawal of their merchant services by their acquirer uh, because of the fraud that they suffered in that one, that one huge loss. 75% well, another... but from an EMP card. So. And another important point of confusion to clarify is that EMV does nothing to encrypt the data after it's been read. So uh, unless you are doing something else, that d data is still sitting in the clear past that terminal interaction. EMV introduces dynamic data into the transaction flow that makes it more difficult to counter create counterfeit cards, but it doesn't encrypt the data at all. Um, well, it, yeah. depends on, it, it, depends on, it depends on other things. Um, you know, that there are there are other point of sale um, strategies with encryption and tunneling. That I mean, it's, so that, that 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 was the point of my earlier question. It's it's hard to know if you're a merchant what to do because there are so many different variations on you know on the theme. So if you're trying to figure it out, where do you start? And how do you actually, um, you know, how do you actually prioritize the investments in, uh, you know, in, in all of these things? Because it, it does force, you know, a bit of a think, a bit of a think about how the priori prioritization and the allocation of, of spend to protect um, the data and also, obviously, their losses is, uh, you know, is a big deal. Um, a question, though, be, before we wrap up, that came from someone listening, and this is for the Briterian guys. So they're they're on your webpage. That that's a good that's a good thing. And there's a question about the difference between the various things that we've talked about. So you have other other things called I predict and I prevent. Uh, just a few minutes on on the differences between that and I detect. Yeah, I would say I detect is a, is a relatively new product for us. Uh, we're Obviously, data breach is a very important topic, so we're making a push into that area. Um, the different products that we have are focused really on, on uh, different functions. Um, I predict is, is more about uh, forecasting, so things like a chargeback prediction or delinquency prediction, credit risk, that kind of thing. Uh, that's what something like I predict is really focused on. Uh, I prevent is, is a fraud scoring engine uh, for us, transaction scoring engine. Uh, whereas iDetect is really focused on bringing together uh, the scoring engine with also a merchant profiling engine as well, uh, focused on, for example, finding the geographic locations of specific branches uh, that suffered a breach, that sort of thing. Um, so they all do use artificial intelligence and machine learning, but really for different functions and different purposes. Uh, but iDetect is, uh, is a newer product from us. Uh, we're moving pretty heavily into the data breach space right now. They do all work together, though. Um, they're modular. Uh, the technology platform is such that you can use each each one of those independently, depending on uh, you know what your business case is, uh, what specific functions uh, you need. Okay, so there's a, there's another. I'm sorry, there's there's another question. Um, uh, so if if I'm a merchant and I detect is something I'm interested in, uh, is there a requirement to provide? all customer card numbers as input to the analysis engine? How does that work? Let me take that one. Uh, if, if it's for the end merchant, 
we're providing them yeah. with an overview on on their solution. So all we need to know is their merchant IDs. So once we know their merchant IDs, we can we can help monitor their risk with them using a software solution based sort of system uh, in the you know, effectively cloud based application that they can have access to to track uh, their data breach graphs. So you know, if you think back to the earlier slide where you saw the graph of the IPTEC scores, for each of their individual uh, merchant IDs, they can be tracking that score over time and will receive a data breach alert if uh, the IPTEC system says, we think you should look at this, this individual merchant ID as the activity levels that we're seeing elsewhere reflected back to this common post purchase uh, are showing an increased level yeah. and you should look into that. So, so the merchants just have to come to us, uh, speak to us, provide their merchant IDs, and in many cases we're dealing with the acquirers who are then going to be dealing with their merchants going forward and providing the solution to them on a paid for or even potentially as a value added basis. Gotcha. So in the in the couple minutes we have left, Neil, I know you've got a slide to kind of wrap us up at the end. Do you wanna do you wanna go through that? Sure. I mean just just a very quick summary about IDETEC. Firstly, as you've seen, it provides real time results based on proven AI models. So it actually works in real time. This is not near real time. If a merchant um, would see an increased alert level even during the day, there's the potential with IDETEC to tell you straight away about it. And we're using this patented smart agent technology to spot that anomalous cardholder behavior and to trace those results back to that common point of purchase, that common merchant ID. And as we've seen, based on the simulations that we've run, we can be spotting those data breaches within five days, five to 10 days, first transactions being executed by the criminal. In many cases, these are the test transactions that are taking place. And just to give you an overview on that, our closest competitive solution uh, is about nine to 10 times slower than that. Still pretty good, but nine to 10 times slower than I detect. And overall, we can be saving issuers and merchants and insurers over 90% of their total losses from data breach should they use I detect spot those data breaches early. And again, we've talked about that in the early slides. Julie's talked about the brand damage that can, can suffer, even for issuers who are totally innocent in this whole situation. Um, because that 10% of folks who stop using cards, even for a short space of time, they're associating the use of that card with the data breach rather than, you know, the breach occurring at the individual merchant location. So for the issuer, it help, can help prevent brand damage. For the merchant, it will certainly help prevent brand damage from negative media attention. And, yeah, and the acquirer as well can be assisting in the whole chain, making sure that that overall brand damage is limited. And, and finally, just a point for acquirers. If they're choosing to resell, I can take to their merchants, which is an option, they could actually generate some increased revenues from it whilst providing a great value service out to their, to their customers. So that's a quick that's a quick summary. So thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Well, well this uh, this has been a, a really a really interesting discussion about a topic that is certainly timely but also very costly for the payments ecosystem on a on a variety of fronts. So I want to thank everyone who uh, gave us their time today and to Neil Thomas and Julie for being a part of the discussion today. Um, for those of you who did tune in, we will be uh, putting a, a summary of this online in a couple of days as well as the slides. So thanks everyone for joining in. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.